Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome all to our second webinar on Textual History Matters, co-hosted by the Stanford Libraries and Stanford Text Technologies. I'm Benjamin Albritton, Rare Books Curator here at the Stanford Libraries. My colleagues and I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today and look forward very much to the presentation by today's speaker, Professor Marina Rusto. Before we begin, I'd like to speak briefly about how the webinar will be run today. After the introductions, uh, Marina will give her presentation, and then Professor Elaine Traharn will moderate a question and answer session. You can submit your questions for that session with the Q&A button uh, throughout the webinar. Elaine and our colleague Agnieszka Bachman will be monitoring those as they come in, and when Marina's done, Elaine will use your questions to continue the discussion. So, without further ado, let me introduce my colleagues and panelists today. Dr. Agnieszka Bachman is a Wallenberg Postdoctoral Research Fellow at Stanford in the Department of English. She received her PhD from Uppsala University in 2017, and her research brings together manuscript studies and digital methodologies. She has worked on the project, The Norse Perception of the World, a mapping and analysis of foreign place names in medieval Swedish and Danish texts, and has been recently engaged in the study of materialities of medieval manuscripts and digital platforms. Exploring the physical traits of books alongside digital representations of those objects, moving toward theorizing the impact of various modes of representation on our engagement with medieval materials. Agnieszka will be monitoring the behind the scenes activity in today's webinar, making sure that things run smoothly. Professor Elaine Traharn, known to many of you already, is the Roberta uh, Bowman Denning Professor of English at Stanford. Her work over the last several decades in exploring medieval manuscripts from a variety of perspectives has been foundational. And her long time, uh, and her long time interest in engaging with the digital has led to groundbreaking work in representation and more recently, machine learning and AI. She has several upcoming publications to note, The Cambridge Companion to British Medieval Manuscripts, co-edited with Orietta de Rold, will be out in a couple of months. Medieval Manuscripts in the Digital Age, co-edited with Georgia Henley and myself, will also be out in several months. And her exciting new project, the phenomenal book, Perceptions of Medieval Manuscripts, is currently with the publisher, and we all eagerly await that one. Elaine will be the respondent and moderator for today's webinar. Our main speaker today is Professor Marina Resto, the Kaduri A. Zilka Professor of Jewish Civilization in the Near East at Princeton University, where she is also the director of the Princeton Geniza Lab and is also serving as the director of the Near Eastern Studies Program. She's the author of Heresy and the Politics of Community, the Jews of the Fatimid Caliphate, in which was published in 2008, and most recently of The Lost Archive, Finding a Caliphate in a Cairo Synagogue, uh, published in 2020. In 2015, Professor Rusto was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship uh, for, quote, rewriting our understanding of medieval Jewish life and transforming the historical study of the Fatimid Empire. As long as I have known her, Marina has been a model of passionate scholarship combining her linguistic and analytical skills to tackle thorny problems and seek out new perspectives on questions of social and material history. It is my absolute pleasure and privilege to welcome Professor Rusto today as she presents on the Cairo Geniza in the digital age. Professor Rusto, welcome and take it away. Thank you so much, Ben. When Ben says that um, as long as he's known me, it's a really long time because we were undergraduates together. So thanks, I really appreciate the, the introduction and the opportunity um, to speak here. Um, I am going to attempt to share my screen. I'm getting a very strange message here. So Agnieszka, if you could just check and make sure that I can actually do that. Does it work now? It's giving me uh, options, advanced sharing options, rather than actually allowing me to share my screen. So mm -hmm. 
which it was not doing when we tested it. No, I've given all panelists uh, to permission to share. Hmm. I'm not sure what else to do. Try making me the host and see what happens. Um, you are already co-host. Okay, it seems to have been fixed. That is great. Oh, excellent. Perfect. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to you about um, the research that I do on the Cairo Veniza, and I'll be explaining what that is in a moment and why the research um, matters. But um, I'm going to be talking in particular about what the digital age has brought um, to the study of the Geniza and what it's still bringing. And um, I'm doing this because I'm really curious to hear from all of you. Um, the more I learn about digital projects that aren't mine, um, the more surprised I become by the similarities and the differences, which is a way of saying that the similarities aren't always where I think they are. Um, and the differences aren't always where I think they are. So I'll find myself, you know, reinventing a wheel here or there or coming up with something innovative without having any idea how innovative it is. Um, so the more we can compare notes about digital projects, I think the better off uh, we all are. Most of the manuscripts that I study um, look something like this, which is to say they are one pagers because they're documents. They're uh, in many cases incomplete um, fragmentary, and the fragments um, can often exist in different libraries under different shelf marks. So um, this is definitely a case of fragmentology, um, and it makes, uh, it makes things more challenging, but it also makes digital methods an absolute necessity, um, which is strange to say because when I uh, was educated in graduate school in the late 90s and, and early aughts, I had absolutely no idea um, about anything digital, so uh, beyond being able to word process. So the fact that this has become so essential to, to what I do um, is something that I never, I never really expected to happen and it's created lots of new possibilities. Um, what you're looking at is um, what in technical parlance um, for papyrologists, and even though this is paper and not papyrus, um, anybody who works on, uh, on this stuff just considers themselves a papyrologist anyway, um, so this is an unpublished uh, join. And a join is um, uh, several parts um, of a manuscript that, um, that somebody's managed to piece together. In this case, Mordechai Akiva Friedman uh, from Tel Aviv University. Um, this is a legal query written to the son of Moses Maimonides um, in the 13th century. So um, briefly, the Cairo Geniza um, exists uh, because there is a tradition, um, not just among Jews, but throughout the medieval Middle East, um, that uh, anything written shouldn't just be casually discarded. If you think about literacy statistics and how precious anything written must have been, it makes a certain amount of sense. If you also think about the handmade nature of medieval culture in general, this isn't a, a culture in which things are just casually discarded. Um, there are also various religious stipulations in Judaism involving not destroying um, the name of God in Hebrew characters or by extension, any text in Hebrew characters. But in fact, the Cairo Geniza and what it came to hold was so parallel with other uh, medieval caches all over Eurasia. Um, and here I'm not, I'm not just talking about Jewish, manuscript caches, that there seems to have been some broader sort of region-wide um, tradition of, uh, of storing manuscripts in some kind of a limbo rather than deliberately destroying them. The term Geniza comes from the Hebrew Beit Geniza, which is um, a, a way of describing a storage chamber for worn texts. And in the particular case that I study, um, this uh, Geniza was found not just in Cairo, but in the 
uh, medieval uh, residential core of Cairo known as Fustat in a synagogue called the Ben Ezra. One of the um, amazing things that's happened in, uh, um, in the last couple of months because of the pandemic is that the Egypt Antiquities Authority has created um, virtual uh, reality sites um, all over Egypt. And one of them is the Ben Ezra. So if you wanna see the Ben Ezra in 360 degrees, um, you, can, uh, you can go to the Egypt Antiquities Authority. I actually just tweeted the link, I think, last night. Um, so Cairo, in fact, um, in uh, the Middle Ages, um, was a uh, royal compound that had been founded by the Fatimids when they conquered Egypt in 969. Um, the vast majority of the population lived in Fustat, um, which had a Roman core, um, and you can still see where it says Roman Tower. There's, there are still some Roman um, ruins there. Um, today, if you ask for a Fustat, people will give you a confused look um, in Cairo. What you have to ask for is Coptic Cairo, and it's called Coptic Cairo because of the large number of Coptic churches, and there's also a fantastic Coptic museum there. And those are the sites that you see on the inset map in yellow. Um, and nestled among these Coptic churches is the Ben Ezra Synagogue. Um, which was uh, rebuilt um, over an older foundation um, in the 11th century. So this is what it looks like on the ground. You would hang a right at the gentleman with the cane, and if you get to the Coptic Museum, you've gone too far. And this is the synagogue from the outside, which actually makes it look quite a bit larger than it is. Um, this is a view from the mezzanine level, which is the women's gallery. And if you look to the left-hand side, um, of the women's gallery, you'll see a little opening in the wall. And that was the opening, uh, or something like it, through which um, uh, all of these manuscript fragments would have been deposited starting in the 11th century up until the late 19th century. When I say something like it, it's because the synagogue was completely rebuilt in the 1890s. Um, supposedly, it was a more or less a replica of what had been there before, according to the eyewitness accounts that we have, but nobody is really sure. Um, but what we do know is that uh, a, a large number of manuscripts accumulated. Um, and in fact, it was the rebuilding of the synagogue itself in the 1890s that ultimately led to these manuscripts being dispersed um, in uh, private collections and libraries um, over a vast uh, terrain of, uh, of, of geographic space. Um, so while on the one hand, the Cairo Geniza has become our principal source for understanding um, certainly the Jews of Egypt, but even beyond the Jewish communities of Egypt. And there's quite a bit in the cache that is centered on Fusat and Cairo themselves. In fact, it represents a much, much larger world. Um, so the Jewish world that we knew about before the discovery of the Geniza was already pretty large, included the whole of the Mediterranean um, and large parts of West Asia. But once you uh, consider everything that's come out of the Geniza, in fact, we're talking about a much, much vaster Jewish world that also comprises the Indian Ocean Circuit all the way um, over to Sumatra and Malacca. Um, so it's completely rewritten um, the, the history of the Middle Ages, but especially economic history. When Geniza fragments were um, ultimately dispersed from the synagogue, um, the lion's share of them went to Cambridge University. So this is an iconic photo in Geniza studies of Solomon Schechter, um, who was a, a professor of rabbinics at Cambridge um, in the 1890s, having returned from Cairo with crates and crates of Geniza fragments. And uh, you can see him absolutely surrounded uh, by them. Um, after having spent a, a whole season, so basically nine months, um, in the Ben Ezra synagogue, um, doing what he described as destroying his lungs um, in the dust, although that dust was probably very important in, in the fact that Geniza fragments got preserved at all, um, because the, the dust is limestone dust, um, and, uh, and that turns out to be very good for the preservation of manuscripts, but nobody, nobody knew that back then. Um, the, the story of the Geniza's discovery is absolutely fascinating. You can see Schechter, the same photo um, on the cover of this book, um, Sacred Trash by Adina Hoffman and Peter Cole, um, which is, it's a fantastic book. It's a page turner. It's based on um, lots of archives from 
those who did the discovering and their children and grandchildren, um, you know, Hoffman and Cole basically like talked their way into the attics of, uh, of various family members to find unpublished correspondence and, and figure out, in fact, how all of these collections came together. And it's a completely fascinating story that runs parallel with many other manuscript discovery stories of the period. Um, so the papyrus heap at Oxyrhynchus was excavated in precisely the season when Schechter was in Cairo, 1896-1897. Um, likewise, the uh, Qubat al-Khazna, the Dome of the Treasury in Damascus, in the Umayyad Mosque, which yielded an estimated 200,000 fragments, was also um, being laid open in the 1890s. Not to mention Egyptology, all the ancient Egypt stuff that we um, have all heard much more about. So um, Geniza research is very much a work in progress. It's been going on obviously for quite some time, 130 plus years on the one hand, but on the other, we're nowhere near um, identifying and cataloging everything that came out of it. Um, so any figures that I give you are subject to change. Um, the vast majority of what came out of the Geniza dates from a, these kind of core medieval centuries between 950 and 1250. And that's because the Jewish communities of Cairo, like all the communities of Cairo, moved northward um, toward, the old, the, toward the Fatimid royal compound um, in 1250 as the, the cities of Cairo and Fustat merged and kind of filled in. That said, there are important pockets of Geniza material from the 16th century and the 19th century especially, and those are finally beginning to get their due. Um, much of that material is not in Arabic or Judeo-Arabic, like the medieval material, but rather in, uh, in Ladino, and there's also quite a bit of Ottoman Turkish. Um, when you calculate um, all the, the figures, um, it, the, well, the number that I'm going to quote to you is 400,000 pages or fragments of pages, but um, as any medievalist knows, what a page really is, um, is a question, because you can have a bifolio, which for us would be four pages, um, for us meaning us modern people, um, you can have recto verso. So what exactly is a page? And it's not helped by the fact that all of the different library collections um, calculate their, their page count slightly differently. So this is a kind of estimate just to give you a sense of proportion. Um, of those 400,000 pages, uh, the vast majority of it um, is texts meant for posterity. I'm going to put books in quotation marks because the book could take many forms um, in medieval Cairo. There was the Codex, which is the book as we know it today, but there were um, other formats as well, vertical scrolls, pamphlets, um, and much of uh, what you find um, in the Geniza was uh, books copied by the people who intended to read them. So not professionally copied scribal um, manuscripts um, of the type you might be used to if you, uh, if you study Latin or something like that, but rather um, unprofessionally copied books, which is um, great for the history of a culture because you can figure out sort of who was reading what as opposed to who had the money to commission what. So that leaves uh, 40,000 documents. Um, and that's what I study. Um, not just me, but a couple of dozen other people around the world. Um, and the documents are uh, comprised letters, uh, legal deeds of, of various kinds, marriage contracts, partnership agreements, um, people suing other people, uh, testimonies, um, and not just from Jewish courts, also from, um, from Qadi courts, from Islamic courts, um, as well as lists and ephemera of every conceivable variety. So if you're a social historian like me, um, this is really an opportunity not to be missed. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, there are uh, many collections of Geniza documents having to do with the history of how things were collected. Cambridge, which is the youngest, in quotation marks, um, collection because uh, it came into being in the, 18, uh, in the late 1890s, um, is also the largest collection. The Jewish Theological Seminary was based on an even older collection, although JTS didn't acquire this collection until the 1920s. Each collection sort of has its own um, individual history, and each one is fascinating. Um, and uh, some are being researched and some haven't been researched at all. So in many cases, we actually don't have a great idea of how these collections came together anymore. Um, and that's a topic that's 
becoming increasingly interesting. And then in the tiny script, I'm putting the smaller collections, but um, I want to I want to put them because small doesn't necessarily mean insignificant. Um, the Princeton Theological Seminary. So I just I hasten to add, Princeton University does not own a single Geniza fragment. It has some cognate material, but uh, we simply have, although we have the largest collection of Middle Eastern manuscripts in North America, um, Geniza collecting was never something that the university did. Um, there is, however, a single Geniza fragment that uh, is native to um, Princeton, New Jersey, and it's at the Theological Seminary, but it's a very, very important uh, copy of a 10th century letter. So, um, you know, quantity and quality are not always directly proportionate. Um, and so this is, this is a chart just giving you a sense of the proportions. Cambridge is the largest, um, the Jewish Theological Seminary, second largest. Uh, the St. Petersburg collection is the third largest, although it comes actually from a different synagogue um, in Cairo, um, followed by the Bodleian, um, the John Rylands, uh, the British Library, and uh, many, many other smaller collections. Okay, so that brings me um, back to the subject uh, of of joins and, um, and, and why joins matter. So this, this was my first join. I found this join in 2007 completely by accident. I was um, presenting the two documents that are on the verso of these, um, of these two fragments of paper um, and I was photocopying a handout and then I noticed that the tear um, had, uh, you know, they had inverse shapes and I said, hmm, that's really weird. And then I realized that the text, the Hebrew text that I'm showing you now was in fact the same text, um, which is the book of Zechariah from the Hebrew Bible. Um, and it was only at that point that I realized that the, the scribe who wrote this text had taken um, the two documents on the back and glued them together in order to write this longer uh, vertical scroll, Rotulus. So this is a great example of a user copied manuscript. Um, but today these two fragments are divided by an ocean, one in New York and the other one um, in Oxford. Um, most of the, the joins um, that have been found have been found in just this way, where you're deep into studying a particular topic and, you know, you have your nice, like, metaphorical pile of fragments in your mind, um, and, uh, and suddenly you start to realize that there are connections between them. There can also be joins uh, among fragments in single libraries. So this is um, a join of three fragments from Cambridge. Um, and uh, I found this, I was interested in the Arabic text, um, which is a government memorandum. Um, that was for the work that I did um, for my, my recent book, The Lost Archive. So 11th century Fatimid government texts, very, in very short supply otherwise, so I was tracking them down throughout the Geniza. Um, but these texts were reused for a grammatical work in Judeo-Arabic, which is Arabic and Hebrew characters, um, which is uh, what Jews at the time um, wrote. And um, luckily, I had a colleague who was researching the Judeo-Arabic text and had already um, uh, put together a list of fragments. So I just started going through his list. And lo and behold, I was able to find a third and then eventually a fourth um, bit of this original Arabic text. Uh, here's another example um, that uh, S.D. Goytain, who I'll be talking about in a minute, uh, his student Mordechai Akiva Friedman and Friedman's student Amir Ashur um, were able to put together um, over the years. Um, this is a, an Indian Ocean trade letter. Um, this is a fascinating kind of sub cache of documents from the Geniza attesting to the especially Western, but also a little bit Eastern Indian Ocean trade in the 12th century. And here's another internal uh, Cambridge join um, that Goytain found back in the 1970s. Um, <laughs> finding a join isn't quite as exciting as like finding a new particle in physics, but we do get excited about it and, uh, and, and we now post them on Facebook. So my colleague Oded Zinger from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem um, is an amazing uh, finder of joins. And um, here's one that he, he posted on Facebook a couple of years ago. Um, my, uh, my former PhD student, Craig Perry, who is now at Emory University, um, found, uh, found a join uh, just last week that he posted on Facebook and you know, people get very excited about this kind of thing. Um, so the finding of joins brings me to the topic of digitizing Geniza collections, um, which um, is, it, it's, it's going to sound, I mean, sorry for the pun, disjointed um, in the sense that there have been various efforts um, over the decades actually 
um, to digitize this material and they haven't aimed to do quite the same thing. Um, so each project has sort of had its own set of goals and um, I'm going to focus on, on two of them, but I want to also give you kind of the lay of the land more generally. Um, so the Princeton Geniza project, which I now direct, I came to Princeton in 2015 and that was part of my mandate when I arrived, um, is the oldest of them and in fact um, goes back to uh, 1985, um, which might sound surprising um, <laughs> given that uh, people were barely just getting into personal commute, computing in 1985, but IBM had given a big grant of, of computers to Princeton and, um, and, and there were various other pieces that fell into place that I'll, I'll mention uh, in a moment that yielded the Princeton Geniza project. Um, Penn and, uh, and Cambridge um, together uh, embarked on um, a very important digitization pro uh, process in 2000 devoted mainly to, um, to imaging. And actually one of, the, um, one of the, the brains behind that, I think is now at Stanford, Heidi Lerner. So I just wanna give a, give a shout out um, there. I texted uh, Arthur Kieron, who's a Judaica, Judaica librarian at Penn yesterday and said, you know, what's the exact date of the Penn Cambridge project? And he goes, is that for that Stanford lecture? You need to give a shout out to Heidi Lerner. I was like, thank you, I didn't know. Um, then the Friedberg and Isa project, um, funded um, by a private philanthropist, um, Albert Doe Friedberg in Toronto, um, was the most and is the most ambitious um, of, these, of these projects. Um, and then the Cambridge University Digital Library, which has um, brought imaging into the realm of IIIF um, for those who, who know what that is. And if you don't, it doesn't matter for now. Um, so, but like I say, each of them has a slightly different remit. So the Princeton Geniza project focus has only ever focused on documentary texts. So the 40,000 um, documents that I was referring to earlier. Um, the Penn and the uh, Cambridge collections um, both were focused on um, their own manuscripts, the manuscripts that they owned, which makes sense because they're libraries. So that's what they should be doing, right? Is focusing on digitizing um, their own uh, collections. Um, the fact that there was this collaboration between Penn and Cambridge ultimately led to the possibility of broader interlibrary collaborations um, and that finally yielded the Friedberg Geniza project. So while the Princeton project um, it, at, in its initial um, iteration focused mainly on transcriptions, which is to say, you know, you're looking at a couple of scraps of Geniza document, but even if you know how to read Hebrew script and even if you, you know, had your like four or five years of classical Arabic, um, it's still not so easy to read the stuff. So transcriptions um, both uh, save you the trouble of paleography, but they uh, also make the text searchable. Um, so I was, uh, you know, I used the Princeton Geniza project when I was writing my dissertation um, in the 1990s, mainly by conducting word searches on a core of, at the time, about 3,000 transcriptions. Um, the Penn Cambridge project um, put together lots and lots of descriptions um, and also images um, of texts, and that's that's still up on uh, on Penn's main um, digital library website. Um, the Friedberg and Isa project had a slightly different angle on this, which is um, they were the force behind getting all of the Geniza, all of the different collections imaged. Um, so that was a, a huge game changer for the field. Um, and made it possible to work on a completely different scale. Um, you no longer had to get on a plane or blind yourself looking at microfilms um, to look at this stuff. You could just do it from the comfort of your own um, pajamas. Um, FGP also did quite a bit for um, the bibliographic um, data, which is to say, um, let's say you're looking at this lovely Geniza frag and you think, oh my God, this is so important. I need to publish this. Wait a minute, has anyone worked on it before? It could potentially take you like months, maybe years to figure that out. Um, so FGP sent teams into libraries to comb through um, journals and, uh, and figure out who had talked about which fragments in print, which was an enormous contribution to scholarship. Um, and FGP also put its um, vast uh, computing muscle um, behind the problem of joins um, through um, uh, computer vision um, technology. And uh, if there's time, I'll get to that. Uh, later on. Um, and finally, the Cambridge um, Cuddle, as they call it, at Princeton we have Puddle, 
um, at Cambridge they have Cuddle, which is like way cuter. Um, they do imaging and, um, and they describe what they have as well. So that was pretty much the state of play um, until um, 2015, um, at which point I got to Princeton and was charged with directing the Princeton uh, Geniza project. So the Geniza project, when I started directing it, um, consisted of a core of, um, at the time, 4,000 350 transcriptions of Geniza texts. And its main um, mandate was to, to have these texts be searchable. Um, so if you wanted to look for a particular shelf mark, you would type it into the search bar and up would come a transcription. This is um, a text of a, uh, um, a legal testimony um, in a combination of Hebrew, Arabic, and uh, Aramaic, or Hebrew, Judeo, Arabic, and Aramaic, which is completely typical um, for these documents. So the transcriptions were really kind of the core um, of, uh, of, of what there was. Um, why were all these transcriptions digitized in the first place? So this gets to a kind of fascinating story of um, scholars, scholarship, and research. And here I'm going to bring you behind the scenes because this is, um, to my mind, the most interesting piece, right? When you're looking at a digital project, you're seeing one thing, but um, when you find out kind of what went into it behind the scenes, it's a totally different um, a set of questions and, and stories that aren't always well represented um, by the digital uh, interface. So um, S.D. Goitain, Shlomo Dov Goitain, who I mentioned earlier, um, he was the person who put the documentary Geniza on the map. And the documents being um, so exciting, in many ways he put the Geniza on the map, period. Um, he was born in Bavaria in 1900 and um, uh, taught at, uh, at Penn um, from 1950, I think, seven until 1969, at the time they had mandatory retirement. Um, and in 1970, he came to Princeton, not to the university, but to the Institute for Advanced Study. And he spent the last 15 years of his life there. Um, he is the author of like hundreds and hundreds of articles and also of this um, multi-volume work called The Mediterranean um, Society, subtitled uh, The Jewish Communities of the Arab World um, in the Middle Ages. Um, if you look at Goitain's Mediterranean Society, you will be impressed by how inclusive and vast it is. You'll get a sense of this huge world that I showed you on the map earlier, stretching all the way from the Iberian Peninsula um, to Indonesia. Um, but at the same time, no one was more aware than Goitain himself of um, the limitations of his endeavor. He had been working on the Geniza for 40 years, but he knew there was much, much more to do. So with this kind of you know, disarming humility, um, he himself said about a Mediterranean society, it's only a sketch, meaning, you know, please, students, have at it. There's, there's much more that can be done. To give you a sense of how this works on the inside, um, I've pulled out a, a footnote almost at random um, from volume one, which is devoted to economic life, um, a section on, on craftspeople. And I've, uh, I've brought up the footnotes. And if you look at the footnotes, um, what you'll get is what might look to you like gobbledygook. In fact, these are two shelf marks from the Cambridge University Library. Taylor Schechter, a TS stands for Taylor Schechter. Um, Taylor uh, was the master um, of St. John's College at the time, um, which uh, provided the funding um, for bringing the Geniza fragments back to Cambridge and Schechter after Solomon Schechter. So these are two shelf marks of uh, Geniza fragments at Cambridge. And if, uh, and, and the whole purpose of the Princeton Geniza project originally was to take that footnote of Goitain's and to translate it um, into, um, into a transcription so that you could actually search the text. Um, in fact, there was much more to the infrastructure. Like to get from Goitain to a digitized transcription, um, there, was, there were other things that needed to be done. So let me just back up one second. Um, and so in 2015, when I got to Princeton, um, together with Eve Krakowski, um, who's, um, who's also on the faculty in my department um, and is a Geniza specialist, we decided together that we wanted to expand the remit um, of the PGP. And instead of focusing just on transcriptions, which are utilizable only by people who are already specialists in the Geniza, because you have to know how to read um, you know, at least one Semitic language um, to use these things. We also wanted to have English language descriptions so that other people could have a sense of what's, what's in the Geniza, um, as well as translations when possible. 
and what I'm going to call for now the interim products of scholarly research. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Um, so we wanted to expand the remit by um, making the Geniza accessible to non-specialists, um, but also um, we wanted to expand the footprint of the Geniza project. So instead of the original core of about 4,000 um, documents and transcription, we wanted to see, well, what's in these 40,000? So we started focusing much more on description than on transcription. If you want to transcribe a document, um, it might take you an hour to do 80% of it, and then it might take you another year to nail down that last 20%, the words you can't read, the words you can't understand, um, you know, the holes to reconstruct what might have been um, in, in the ripped parts, um, that kind of thing. And there was quite a bit of cherry picking that had gone on um, in the gener generations before us. Totally understandably, right? Letters tend to be great storytelling. Testimonies are great storytelling, but there are lots of other documents that might not tell such coherent stories that had been um, paid less attention to. Um, and descriptions, on the other hand, you can look at a document for, you know, period it for 15, 20 minutes, figure out generally what's going on and write a description and then move on. So that was what we wanted to to focus on, Eve Krakowski and I. Um, so what we, what we tried to do was to give a sense of what the interim steps might have been or might be for a scholar trying to understand this stuff. And Goitain, um, as it happens, had left a, a huge scholarly um, nachlas. Um, he had left 26,000 index cards related to Geniza fragments, as well as um, the transcriptions that formed about half of that original core of 4,000 transcriptions um, that he had never published, as well as some unpublished translations and lots and lots of other kinds of notes. So um, essentially what I've spent the, the last, um, well, my first three years at Princeton up until 2018 doing um, was to make Goitain's scholarly notes accessible via the PGP um, website. So now when you um, bring up the same fragment that I was talking about before, you can get Goitain's index card. Um, they're not always easy to read themselves. This one happens to be mainly in English, but there are lots of Goitain's index cards that are also in Hebrew and Arabic. And I actually find it easier to read medieval Hebrew handwriting than Goitain's um, early 20th century German Hebrew handwriting. Um, this is Goitain's uh, typed transcription of this text um, on which the digitization was, um, was based. And then this is his unpublished translation. So all of these are interim products of scholarly research um, that give you a much richer sense of uh, a Mediterranean society and what went into it and also what didn't go into it. There's an exercise that I do every semester with my undergraduates where I have them read a single section of Goy time, six, seven pages from a Mediterranean society. Then I have them read the footnotes. Then I have them make a spreadsheet based on the footnotes. Then I have them find whichever documents they can find that have been translated to English because they're generally coming to me, although not always, without the language skills. I have them read through these documents in translation and then I have them go back to Goy time's text and tell me what else could he have done with them that he didn't do. And it's uh, always fascinating to see um, what they come up with. You could write maybe you know, 80 different Mediterranean societies, if not more, simply based on Goitain's footnotes. So that was um, the, the basic goal in expanding um, the PGP, to take this sketch of Goitain's, um, or to maybe use a different metaphor, to take the whole carpet that was the Geniza and flip it over so that you could see the threads in the back um, and a little bit of, of how um, the whole scholarly endeavor um, might, be, might be put together. So when you bring up um, a text in the PGP, you're gonna find, um, and this, this brings us even further behind the scenes, and uh, um, I always find it kind of like fascinating to, to see what's, uh, what's in the kishkas of these digital projects. So, um, so here's the transcription. So I, I talked about that. This transcription was ultimately from Goitain's files, but then um, worked over and published by his student, uh, Mordechai Friedman. Um, and then you have the description. In this case, it is, it's a description based on Goitain's um, original uh, notes. Um, there is a translation available, so we have it linked to the record. And then you have these interim products of research. So 
um, in this case, uh, not a very informative index card. Um, this one is, uh, is bare and minimal. Um, so you have to know that it was cataloged in uh, Shaul Shaked's 1969 catalog of documentary Geniza, um, published by a scholar named Simcha Asaf, and then ultimately in Goitain's India book, which was published posthumously um, by, by Mordechai Friedman. Um, this is a slightly fuller index card to give you a sense of how they, they generally look, but it's for a different fragment. So you can see this is in, uh, in English, in uh, Hebrew slash Judeo-Arabic and in Arabic. And, um, and then here is, uh, is the original transcription that, um, uh, and description that, that this information was based on. So here you're getting kind of um, in a telescopic fashion um, all of the steps that led up to what's in um, the PGP. Um, when I talk about descriptions, um, that's actually kind of a, a laconic statement um, that masks that there's something actually more complex going on here, um, which is that um, each record has metadata um, associated with it, as most records in a database do. Um, but the structure of metadata turns out to be an enormously um, complex question, and it varies depending on basically what you're trying to do with the database. Um, and so here, this is, this is where I bring you into the, the behind the scenes. All of the metadata that we have in the PGP is based on, um, uh, is, is captured in this uh, Google Sheet. Um, and, uh, you know, whether or not Google Sheets is, is the thing that we want to be using in the long term is a, um, is, a, is a complex question that I've only begun to address recently. Um, but it is uh, very, very good for our purposes because it allows um, many researchers to contribute at the same time, um, which, is, which is great. Um, so we have uh, close to, I think, 30,000 entries um, on this sheet now. So we're approaching that, that 40,000 mark. Hopefully someday we'll get there. Um, and the structure of these records turned out to be um, a very, very long undertaking, deciding essentially what our columns were going to be in lay people's terms, um, deciding on our data architecture in more specialized terms. Um, so this was a conversation that happened over the course of that three years until we finally nailed down um, the data architecture that we wanted. And the, the core categories are um, the shelf mark, obviously, you need a, a stable identifier. Um, the, uh, the type of document, I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, we have hashtags, um, descriptions, and editions. Um, so that might seem simple enough, but it turns out that there are a whole bunch of other ancillary categories that we had to figure out whether they really belonged on the spreadsheet um, or whether we just wanted to drop them into tags and keep our lives simple. And that's ultimately what we decided to do. So let me just um, walk you through that point um, more slowly. If you take the column divided, um, the, the column that describes the type of document. Um, so we have a, a number um, of options here. There are legal documents, letters, lists or tables. The technical difference being a list is one column, a table is two or more columns. Um, paraliterary documents, which um, I'm not going to get into. Um, state documents, so like that, um, you know, Fatimid memorandum that I was showing you earlier. And then unknown, right? There's a, there's a sign in the Cambridge Geniza Research Unit um, offices uh, at the Cambridge University Library that says unknown is for quitters. So I, I'm, I'm quite in agreement with that, but sometimes you just got to go there. Um, so this very terse list of seven categories took us about as many years to come up with. So we had multiple conferences devoted to um, documentary typologies. We had joint conferences together with our colleagues in Arabic and Greek and Coptic pepperology. We pretty much like ransacked um, the world of documentary typologies. Um, and we came up with a very, very complex um, sort of tree of typologies, which we were very, very happy with. It was a thing of great beauty. It took up like three pages. Um, and then we realized that this was creating a bar to data entry in the project that would be virtually insurmountable. You basically would never want to enter anything. Um, if you're going through dozens of fragments and you just want a kind of quick and dirty description, um, we had to narrow it down. So ultimately we came up with this distilled, pristine gem of a tiny typology that we're very happy with and we just shunted everything else into tags. Um, so if you're dealing with some specialized um, subtype, um, that's what happens in the tags. 
um, just wanted to give some credit where it's due. Um, so Mark Cohen and uh, Avram Yudovich um, founded the Princeton Geniza Project. And the reason they founded it is um, they had both been students of Goytines. Um, and in 1985, when Goytine died, um, Cohen and Yudovich looked at each other and they said, well, that was interesting, but it's over now. And when, when Mark Cohen told me that story, I first almost cried, and then I decided I was going to devote my life to trying to, you know, keep this field alive. Um, but what they decided to do was to take Goytine's Nachlas and digitize it. So that was the birth of the project. Ben Johnston um, has been the computing muscle behind the project since his arrival at Princeton in 2004, and he's now also um, the project's institutional um, uh, memory in many ways, because he's been behind the scenes for so long. Um, and then Eve Krakowski and I took over um, in 2015. Um, so I hope at least I've given you a sense of some of the um, opportunities, dilemmas, and frustrations um, that go into this kind of work. Um, but the, if there's one conclusion that I could make from all of this, it's that um, we here on, on this slide um, we are data mongers, which is to say our jobs, um, we, we regard our, our sort of public facing opportunity with the PGP um, as uh, presenting data that is as beautiful, accurate, and accessible and complete as possible. Um, and what I found that to mean is that um, it's not always possible to spend as much time thinking through issues of functionality, um, you know, what would our ideal PGP website look like? Um, because in fact, it's the, the data that counts here. Um, we're about to undertake um, a, a, a pilot project for um, a new uh, PGP interface. Um, so I might, I might eat those words, but for now, I feel that my, my, my goal with this is to, uh, is to present the best possible data. And with that, I uh, invite your questions. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, hi, everybody. It's Elaine um, in Stanford, and I'm going to mediate uh, your questions. Feel free to add questions to the Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of your webinar screens, and then I'll be able to pick those up. And questions that um, we don't have time to answer because we'll finish promptly-ish at 11-ish. Um, Marina has kindly agreed to follow up on Twitter. If you're on Twitter, it's um, at M Rusto, and you'll see this session has been tweeted anyway. Okay, so can I just start where you, with that last slide, uh, not of the people, but of the joins. Um, there are a number of questions that um, uh, are about the use of uh, com computerized, computer tools um, or methods for searching and finding documents through their shapes that you mentioned very briefly and said you might be able to return to that. So could you just say a little word about how computational tools are assisting in that? Absolutely. Um, I would be happy to. It would also be um, even better if I could show you. Um, I prepared a few slides on that that I didn't get to in the interest of time, but it'll actually take less time for me to explain this with the slides. Um, I'm having that same screen sharing problem, Agnieszka, so if you can work whatever magic you worked before, um, then, then I can get right to it. Um, so um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, joins are a perennial problem. You're looking at something fragmentary and you think, oh, wouldn't it be so nice if I had all of that? Um, a very effective method of finding joins for many decades was simply to be immersed in a particular type of material, um, which ultimately um, uh, you know, produced very solid, if slow, results. Uh, the Freed Bergeniza project um, had a different idea, which ultimately um, bore fruit in a very brilliant way, which is if you could somehow apply, and this goes back, by the way, to the aughts, okay, so you have to remember, like, you know, computing technology in the aughts, what was it like? Um, they um, uh, took the, the, the up-and-coming field of computer vision, and applied um, its findings to the Geniza by essentially using um, facial recognition technology to map the face of Geniza documents, and by doing that to try and match fragments to each other. 
So um, it suddenly became possible if you were looking at a fragment, instead of spending months digging through um, similar fragments, um, the uh, FGP would suggest to you possible joins um, based on its own algorithms. Um, again, I'm unable to share my screen or I would show you an example of how this works. Maybe we can get back to it um, in a moment. Um, the, the FGP algorithms have, um, have their strengths and they have their limitations. Um, the, the strength is that when you find a join with the FGP, it's, it, there's nothing like it um, and, uh, and it's saving you a lot of time and effort. Um, and uh, you know, there's nothing like completeness and there's nothing like being able to do that in your like pajamas. Um, the, um, hold on a second, it looks like I can share my screen. Good. Um, the, the limitations are that there are always gonna be lots of false positives. So I'll show you um, how that looks on the inside. Um, so I, um, <laughs> uh, this, is, this is the FGP um, basic page. Um, in, uh, right when the FGP join finding algorithms were first put on the FGP site, um, I was invited to a conference on the Mamluk period, 1250 to 1517 um, in Egypt, which for me is like way late. Um, I like the Mamluks. I think they're really cool. I don't always work on them. Usually I work before the Mamluk period, but I thought, okay, there's gotta be something I can find um, from the Mamluk period. So I started reading through Goytain and I found this wonderful passage on Jewish infighting, which uh, if anyone knows my first book is like one of my favorite topics. Um, so if you look at the part I've outlined here, a stern rescript by the Nagid, head of the Jewish community, Mabarach to the community of Malij in the Delta, mentions a brawl in a local synagogue. And I said, okay, this is great. In an almost humorous letter to a dignitary in the capital, he's requested to urge the same Nagid to restrain an inveterate troublemaker. Okay, next sentence. From the late Middle Ages, so here my ears perked up because when Goytain says late, he means Mamluk period. Uh, we have an Arabic document showing that a Nagid had indeed gone so far as to prohibit a member of the congregation, a physician, from entering the synagogue. But the physician applied to the authorities, which means that he went to an Islamic court to force the Nagid to let him back into the synagogue, right? So this is a Jew going to a Muslim court and saying, I want you to force my rabbi to let me back into synagogue, right? So this is very, very juicy. So I go to footnote 53, uh, and this is what I find a uh, Cambridge shelf mark. Um, and remember, Goitan has said late, and late usually means Mamluk, but you know, who knows. So I, I look up the fragment, and what I see is this. Indeed, it's an Arabic um, legal document. It's a, a decision from a Qadi court, um, and uh, it's undated, or so I think. So I go to the FGP, and I put in, oh, I just wanted to show you, this is the article um, in the journal of the International Journal of Computer Vision from 2010 that publishes these join um, algorithms. So anyone who's interested in the technicalities can look that up. So I go to FGP and I type in the shelf mark and um, I hit joins suggestions and it presents um, three different algorithms um, represented by these three different tabs. So I talked about the problem of false positives um, so there are many suggestions here and um, zero to one of them are going to be correct, right? Um, now, that's a problem on the one hand because I have to sift through all of this stuff and figure out which one I want. On the other hand, at least I don't have to sift through 400,000 pages. And then on the third hand, it's also going to bring me some other Arabic script material that I might be interested in looking at because Arabic script is in the minority in the Geniza. So the false positives are not always a huge problem. In any case, Here's what I find my first time out of the gate using the join finding algorithm. I was so excited, I can't even tell you because what I had found is the bottom half of the document also in the Cambridge University Library. And so now I could see it as its scribe would have seen it and it even had a date 1463. So Goytain's guesstimate based on the handwriting turned out to be accurate. So that is the application of, uh, of computer vision technology um, to the Geniza, and obviously this has great potential um, for lots of other fields of uh, manuscript studies and fragmentology, only now you can do it in much more sophisticated ways. Uh, fantastic, thank you. I've got a follow-up question from um, Taylor Bennett, from Roger Easton, from Ron Ahrens, who's a Princeton alum, and from Michael Phelps at the um, Early Manuscripts Electronic Library, who are, oh, would like to know if there are other forms of imaging, multispectral imaging or any other kinds of imaging um, that you're using to try and read 
um, these documents. Either try and read the documents because they've been damaged or they're palimpsestic, or to try and read the documents um, uh, in different kinds of ways. Absolutely. These are all names that are known to me. So hello and thank you so much for the questions and uh, we should talk. Um, so uh, the, there are very few um, palimpsests, um, statistically speaking, in the Geniza. Um, the ones that have been, that have emerged are extremely interesting. Um, and, and I'll talk about them in a second. But first I want to talk about why there aren't that many of them. Um, paper technology was introduced to Egypt in the 10th century. And um, when it was, it became a much, much more, first of all, durable medium to use than papyrus had been. Um, and second of all, a much less expensive medium than parchment. So while you do find parchment in the Geniza, um, you're much more likely to find paper. Um, parchment is easy to palimpsest. You just, you know, scrape or rub off um, or wash off the, the, the previous um, ink, the previous inscription. Um, paper is virtually impossible to palimpsest, although they didn't necessarily know that because I've actually seen attempts to palimpsest paper, but it usually destroys the surface of, of the writing itself um, in a way that palimpsesting parchment doesn't do. Um, that said, um, many of the palimpsests that have emerged from the Geniza are fascinating in unexpected ways. One is you have palimpsested Christian books reused for Jewish texts, um, including pre-Islamic, I mean, what in my field would be called pre-Islamic um, Christian writings. So late antique Christian texts in a wide variety of languages, Latin, Greek, Georgian, Armenian, um, uh, and so forth. Um, for, for my money, something that's equally interesting is uh, palimpsested Hebrew texts so um, that are then reused for other Jewish texts. So why is this so interesting? It's interesting because supposedly the Geniza existed in order to save Hebrew script texts from um, an undignified you know, destruction. Um, I don't know what is less dignified than being palimpsested, just like simply obliterating the text. So if Jews were willing to palimpsest um, Jewish texts in order to produce other Jewish texts, then it causes us to rethink um, what we thought we knew about why the Geniza was put together in the first place. So this is the work of my colleague Judith Olshovich Langer um, in, uh, in Paris and, and, and Oxford, um, who discovered palimpsested Hebrew biblical fragments uh, reused for um, Hebrew uh, script legal documents. Um, so that said, the use of multispectral imaging has um, has not really um, uh, been something that's kind of, you know, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a niche within a niche. And I do have a couple of colleagues who are doing it because they're interested in palimpsests, um, but, uh, but they're um, in, the, in the minority. Super, thank you. So um, a, a, a sort of broad uh, category of question, if you like, would be about kind of cooperation. And uh, Lisa Fagan Davis, the Medieval Academy is interested in um, how advanced, uh, uh, you are in, in working with fragments and how much room there is for cooperation with fragmentologists. Uh, Jonathan Miller is interested in knowing about, uh, is there any cooperation with the Dead Sea Scrolls project? And Pauline Lewis is interested to know if there's any cooperation with Egyptian institutions. So how broad the collaborative potential of the PDP is, is the general question. Absolutely. So um, collaboration is something that I'm, um, uh, absolutely committed to and um, want to further wherever I find it. Um, so the will is there. Um, as for the way, that's another question. So um, I do have um, colleagues that I'm uh, working with um, in Egypt. Um, there are, are still medieval texts in Egypt and there is a small Jewish community in Cairo who are very committed to um, preserving these texts and furthering um, their study. Um, and I've given workshops at, uh, at the American University in Cairo, um, and you know, there, there, there's a huge interest in studying this thing as part of the Egyptian past. I mean, not just among the Jewish community, but among scholars of the Middle Ages in Egypt um, in general. Um, the, um, I'm trying to think of the other parts of your question. Yes, Dead Sea Scrolls, collaborators, um, I've had many, many fascinating conversations um, with scholars in the, who work on the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're, the problems that they face are slightly different from the ones that we face. Um, they are doing amazing things with the um, material 
um, problems like, for example, of, um, of virtually unrolling carbonized scrolls like they did for Herculaneum, um, of creating fonts that will enable them to reconstruct um, missing portions of text. But that's because they're largely dealing, not entirely, but largely with known texts. So if you find a fragmentary scroll of Isaiah, um, you have a good idea of how the rest of the text is supposed to look minus variant readings. Um, and that means that even if you have like a tiny little piece, if you can identify it as Isaiah, you can then maybe reconstruct um, what the rest of the scroll might have looked like. That's a very different kind of problem um, from what we deal with when we're dealing um, with documents where we have absolutely no idea what these texts um, are going to say. So there are, and this is kind of what I, what I started off saying in the beginning, there are some fascinating um, areas of overlap, but they're not always where I expect them to be. Fantastic. Okay, so we, we're slightly over time. So there's um, a number of questions about teaching, and I think um, how these materials can be used in teaching and what's accessible for teachers or for other doctoral students. So I think if we take the kind of crowdsourcing and collaborative kinds of questions um, onto Twitter, but also we could possibly put together a kind of quick list of resources that can accompany the YouTube video, if that's okay, Marina, that would be wonderful. So I just want to close then by um, obviously saying thank you so very much for uh, what was an extraordinary um, talk, bringing us kind of right up to speed, but also giving us a very generous sense of um, the project as a whole and the significance of it. And I can tell from the questions that um, people are really sort of buzzing with the connections that they're making between their own research and um, the work that you're doing. So we are hugely grateful that you took the time to do this for us. Um, and uh, we're very grateful to everybody for showing up, all of the participants. We'll take the questions on to Twitter now. And um, also this will go up as a YouTube video for you all to um, look at um, in your own time again. And Marina, thank you so very much. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me and uh, see you on Twitter. I'm going to get right on that. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>